If you move to California with your family, only to find yourself right at the start of a new viral outbreak, what would you do? Emma and Stacy are two high school teenagers caught in the middle of unhappy parents and moving to a new city all at the same time. Like that isn't bad enough, they suddenly find themselves cut off from said parents, dealing with a mind-controlling virus all alone. I'm gonna break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the parasitic worm flu in viral. Signs of the contagious illness will receive special treatment here. Mobilized a national epidemic prevention plan. Believed to be caused by a small worm-like parasite, the public is calling the condition worm flu. Symptoms include increased appetite, fever, bloody cough, and in some cases, seizure. Worm flu can only be spread through the transmission of blood. The chances of an outbreak of an epidemic here are extraordinarily low. Where Oh, where have I heard this before? Turned out great that time, too. All right, let's do this. You creeping. We start out following Emma, creeping on her sister Stacy and her new boyfriend CJ, getting it on in the middle of a high school hallway with the suave and passion of half rabid chihuahuas. I cannot stop eating today. Hey, Evan, show some boob, like, oh God. She's the stereotypical teenage new girl in town, struggles to make friends, feels lonely and misunderstood, shy, envious of her older sister who did in fact adapt quite flawlessly. I am CJ. Stacy's pretty much the opposite. Outgoing, kind of a rebel, a people person. She likes to hang out with those that are different from the usual crowd, like her new boyfriend CJ, mixing with the locals, as she calls it. Come over later. Yeah, I'll try. Evan, you want a ride? Why are you being such a big? Their sisterly relationships definitely a tale as old as time. Polar opposites, conflict between them, but still super close despite all of that. Dad, we're giving Evan a ride home. Hi, Mom. Hi, Mom. When are you coming back? I have a meeting in Kansas City tomorrow. I love you. Gotta go. They've just moved here as a family, but their parents are dealing with some uh, marital troubles. So there's all sorts of dysfunction here right off the bat. Hope that won't bite us in the ass later. <laughs> okay. Or this might be super entertaining. Well, mind your own business and maybe I won't have to kick you. guys just cut it out. Or infuriating. Oh, hey there. <laughs> They've moved to a typical suburban neighborhood in California, complete with NPC neighbors and everything. Doesn't sound too bad if you put all the teenage angst and pending divorce matters aside. I see you looking at your phone. Okay, you wanna play Happy Family? How are things with mom going? Is this where I segue into a better help ad? They do have family plans. You okay? No, my mom's been like coughing in my face. Gracie, Emma's pretty much only friend since the move, says she's not feeling too hot. Her mother's been coughing in her face apparently too. Not cool. Now, just to point out the obvious, this is a movie from 2016. Literally anyone watching this in 2021 or beyond would, just from the intro of the movie and this interaction between Emma and Gracie, already know where this is going. Nerds, you probably smell like sh Go ahead, give yourself the sniff test. Does the pungent aroma of unwashed bro make your eyes water in a mixture of pain and disgust? If so, you probably stand to benefit greatly by checking out today's video sponsor, Scentbird. Scentbird is an awesome subscription service that lets you test drive new designer fragrances every month until you find that special cologne or perfume you simply can't live without. We're talking over 700 premium brands like Gucci, Prada, and Versace, bottles that can normally run as high as 500 bucks a pop. With Scentbird, you'll get 30-day samples of these bad boys for a monthly payment of $16.95. And when you finally find the one for you, you can cancel your subscription at any time, 100% hassle-free. This month, I received three 30-day samples of some banging colognes. First up, we've got Apex by Roja, for when you need to harness your raw animal in instinct in the classiest way possible. Next is Sexual Noir Pour Homme by Michael Germain that'll leave the ladies trembling from the scent of untamed masculine energy. You're still gonna have to talk to them though. And finally, we've got I Don't Know What from Dies and Durga that can either be worn by itself or layered on top of another fragrance for maximum power, which is my favorite of the trio. Don't ruin first impressions with the odor of speed stick and shame. If you're in the US and Canada, use my code 
Nerd 55 off to save 55% on your first month with Sempered, which is just $7 and some change. And then maybe you two can smell like a winner. But remember, this was long before the virus that shall not be named, which this movie actually did us a favor with by calling theirs worm flu, ever made its way into Western society and crippled the world's economy. By which to say, not everyone was as attentive to this stuff back then. People weren't following the news as closely to track the spread of diseases yet until it actually got out of hand. So I don't want to be too harsh on our protagonist from that perspective, but rather try to see it from the pre-worm flu POV we all used to have like five years ago. Oh my god. Even though they're literally looking at a video together of a man zombie-like blood vomiting on an innocent woman in an elevator. And this was named as one of those symptoms in the beginning of the movie. Still, they currently probably would believe the narrative of likelihood of this making its way to the US is relatively low, as we all did at one point. No time to dwell on that for now. There's teenage romance to entertain. <laughs> Why? Why are you calling me when I'm three feet away? Even if that romance is so f brain dead it hurts to watch, whatever. I guess it was supposed to be cute. What have we got here? Their lovey-dovey moment is interrupted by the stereotypical abusive alcoholic stepdad that Evan clearly hates with every fiber of his being. He's sensitive. Though I can't quite blame him, because this guy's clearly an enormous piece of shit. But for now, I don't think Evan cares. After all, IRL Peter Griffin apparently scored him so many sympathy points, he functioned as a wingman. You have been drinking tonight, sir? Okay, I'm gonna need you to step out of the car. There's a threat to is everything okay with you and mom? Emma and her father Michael have a heart to heart about all the obvious changes in their life. And we learn that he basically got laid off at a prestigious university teaching function and was forced to downgrade his existence to teaching high schoolers, which is what caused all the strain. Seems a bit hardcore to me to have your marriage collapse cause you got laid off, but okay. What's crazy about this so far to me is that Emma's father has a PhD in life sciences. He's literally watched the newscast explaining the legitimate pandemic threat, which undoubtedly lays bare the gravity of the situation. Now, much like with our own worm flu, not everyone's gonna take this that seriously, at least right away. Surely the PhD who knows this sh in and out would conclude that this is basically bad news though, or so you'd think. Don't worry, this is just one of the many clues the movie gives us before anyone gets wise. What is that? Like this worm removal video Michael shares with his class. Can anyone tell me what a parasite is? Remember when you had a head lice, Emma? Along with this little verbal kick me sign on his daughter's back. Sometimes they take control. He imparts some fascinating info on the class about parasites and how they manage to take control of their host's actions. This is actually a real thing too. The Last of Us was based on cordyceps, for instance, a fungal infection which ultimately manages to take control of its host entirely. Usually those are ants or other insects like spiders, effectively creating freaks of nature, like zombie spiders. Toxoplasma gondii, mentioned by Michael to his class, is also a real thing, causing rats to seek out cats to get got by, and then causing the cat that ingests the parasite to excrete the parasite once more, repeating the cycle once a rat eats those droppings. Is it like how zombies are always biting people to turn them into more zombies? <laughs> ah yes, Evan. A true connoisseur. Now this concept isn't actually super far-fetched. Humans are just differently equipped, so we can't truly fall prey to these parasites. If someone ever finds a way to alter that though, I don't see why we, in the next 100 years or so of medical and technological advancements, wouldn't ultimately see real rage viruses, like in 28 weeks later, through extensive modifications to rabies or a zombie fungus that could do what cordyceps does, but just with humans. I'd be interested and hearing from any medical research nerds in the comments, as this is actually a topic I could ramble on about for days. Might even warrant its own video at some point. Who knows? And simply become a vehicle for the parasite. Gracie starts gagging coughs up blood and takes off running. Emma, being her decent friend, goes to check on her. 
He's not in the bathroom though. I would check in your school nurse's office. She looked pretty panicked there when she noticed she coughed up a handful of blood, as you should be, and might have just sought out some actual medical help. If not, that is 100% what you should do in a situation like that. Instead, she finds Gracie lying next to a bench outside, seizing up and choking on her own blood, repeatedly smacking her head into the pavement. A nearby Good Samaritan comes over to help, and they both hold her head off the ground together and try to check for a response. Overall, like, a fuck one out of ten here. I mean, this is just so dumb. When someone has a seizure, the most important thing you can do is remove anything nearby that this person could involuntarily hurt themselves with. Put something soft like a jacket or sweater under their head to keep them from giving themselves a concussion, as well as put them on the floor if they're not already there, and turn them on their side to avoid them choking on their own spit, vomit, blood, or whatever. They literally just hold her head up and watch her choke, and just stare into her eyes as she basically dies, before our good Samaritan tells Emma to go get the nurse. At least that's one good decision. <laughs> However, because they didn't put her on her side, and because this is apparently Gracie's zombie transformation going on here, all he's done is position himself perfectly to take a load of bodily fluids right into his face, ensuring he's now next in line. As is often said on this channel, if you're the first to encounter something like this, you're likely screwed no matter what. The caveat here is that this is something that has been steadily shown all over the news channels they had access to for weeks already, probably long before it actually became a legitimate pandemic threat to them directly. This may not mean that they'll prevent the blood money shot our friend here just received, but it would, or rather should, mean that once this does happen, they now know what they're dealing with. At the bare absolute legitimate minimum, Emma should tell the nurse, and then also her father, the life sciences PhD who has actively been following this pandemic threat, what just happened, and the things Gracie had been experiencing recently. Given she started off with insane hunger, progressed into feeling like sh then seizures, and now the blood vomiting on others. Similarly to the videos Emma was even watching just last night with Gracie, even Emma could probably tell what's up here. Do you know if Gracie has been exposed to any livestock? Did Gracie mentioned anything about not feeling well. A lady in the school nurse's office asks him a bunch of questions, clearly trying to establish a diagnosis for the virus. I hope you mentioned the seizing, and blood coughing slash vomiting too, or that the kid that helped you and got blood all over for his effort can relay what Gracie did immediately after she stopped seizing. Ow. Good, Michael's there too, rubbing his eyes when discussing a pandemic threat. Mom, I'm fine. They're checking all the cars that are leaving town. Mom's stuck at the airport, she can't get a taxi. I'm gonna go pick her up. Okay, those things all contradict each other. Assuming the guy who took a face full of blood vomit didn't hide that this happened to him, or even just that Emma told this lady about all the symptoms, no details barred, they're going to conclude this is that virus. What that means, especially in combination with their mom not being able to get a cab at all at the airport, and the fact that the f military is checking cars trying to get out of town, is that the virus is already here. It also means, judging by the fact that it feels like we're getting quarantined in, that the military expects the situation to likely get worse before it gets better, and that we still have a chance to get out if we act fast. Dude, I get it. You already had to uproot your family once, but you've been following this entire virus's timeline, and you're a goddamn PhD in this exact field. You know these signs in front of you are containment measures. You you know what that means. So I'll simplify the actions we should be taking here, as it honestly boils down to two realistic options. Option one, leave the city state if you want to be certain. Dip into your pandemic savings a bit and just stay away from this place for a while. However, that relies on containment being successful, which judging by the fact that Gracie's mom passed the virus onto her after a trip to San Francisco, likely means this virus isn't limited to our town only. Anyway, once safe and sound, somewhere defensible, perhaps somewhere remote, I'd hunker down with a sh 
load of supplies and weapons, and wait for this all to blow over. Given they're in California, where all firearm sales require licensing, I'd suggest some place like Nevada, Oregon, or even Washington State instead, where they can walk into any gun store and buy whatever they need. It might be worth venturing into a colder area, like Oregon or Washington State Mountains, to see if the parasites of this worm flu are among those that cannot stand the cold. They're in a world where they could easily Google this and determine whether this virus affects people who live in year-long cold climates. Option two, barricade and shelter in place. Stock up on canned goods and supplies. Visit a local gun store, if any of the adults in the household are licensed. Otherwise, it would likely take far too long to get the paperwork pushed through, especially when the military is already conducting checks. In that case, it's either hoping your NPC neighbors are NPC enough that they'd lend you a spare gun if you asked, which I seriously doubt. Or you do your best to make some weapons with what you can find in Walmart and Home Depot. Whatever we decide to do, one mandatory step in between right here and now is getting everyone on the same page about this virus. Not only to discourage any really stupid ideas from people who don't comprehend the severity of the situation, but also to ensure everyone knows what the signs of infection are right off the bat. Mandatory step number two is gear. These zombies are ranged enemies due to their spitter capabilities like in Left 4 Dead 2. <laughs> that means we need PPE. Michael, being in life sciences and all, should have clear access to. Hell, even the poorly equipped high school lab he has to work with may have more than enough to satisfy that need. If not, he should have the necessary knowledge to identify the best options available to him at local stores. The other step of the gear equation is weapons. If we have to go down the Home Depot Walmart route, I think the best way to do this is a combination between long-handled sharp tools meant for gardening or cutting. Potentially even something as basic and budget is just a load of peasant spears made from knives and broom handles. If they can add Walmart or a sports store to the equation, .177 caliber air guns that run on CO2, particularly those with steel pellets and a decent muzzle velocity, can be a nice addition. Anything further than 100 feet out, and you'll need to be a really good shot to actually kill anything with one of those. But they look pretty real. And from, say, your upstairs bedroom window, you'd probably be able to fatally wound someone in and say, your driveway. That way, you still have a longer range option to protect your immediate surroundings. With points of entry and downstairs windows properly barricaded, peasant spears and PPE to pick people off and murder holes, they'd automatically create if they breach the barricades through conventional means. If, however, we either already have a lot of guns or do decide to move to an easier state, or simply have a carte blanche license here in California already, my personal suggestions would be for mid to long range encounters, Sig Sauer MCX chambered in 5.56, extended 60 round magazine, EOTech holographic sight with a magnifier, or even a PVS 14 for those nighttime encounters, if Michael's truly ballin' enough to have that kind of dough. For close range encounters, a Glock 19 would be my personal pick. 9mm, accurate, light, comfortable, good magazine capacity, and most important, Importantly, reliable, perfect for dealing with anyone stuck in a murder hole near one of the barricades. Also perfect for self-defense at extremely close quarters, or just in general as a way to keep up volume of fire if your rifle runs dry or jams. We can then still keep PPE and peasant spears on hand, as well as strategically positioned around the house for our offspring, who we'd likely not be able to teach firearm safety to in such a short amount of time, along with a couple of pistols as a last ditch effort, or you know, if they they want to take the easy way out, while the rest of us dabble in the glorious fantasy that is popping zombies in an apocalypse. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. Ah. I love the smell of zombie guts in the morning. So anyway, back to the movie. Guess what? None of what I just said resonates with our characters. Not one tiny bit. Which makes me wonder, why make your protagonist's father a life sciences PhD genius if you're gonna portray him as possessing a negative IQ five minutes later? As he totally ignores the obvious red flags of his chosen profession in front of his very own eyes. Whatever. Their groovy neighbor, Mr. Toomey, drives Emma and Stacy home while Michael's off to go find their mother. People in the neighborhood who are coming to their senses in time are even seen packing their sh- like there's a literal fire lit under their ass. 
Emma sees this in a news article explaining mutations, as well as that the virus itself has already come to California. She tries to call Gracie, but she's not picking up. I wonder why. She's clearly feeling uneasy, but seems to trust her dumb ass parents and sister too much here, even as it becomes super apparent from the military presence quickly ramping up around her that something is totally not fucking okay here. Girls, I can't get back into town. I'm at the store on Route 26. The whole county's under quarantine. This thing is serious enough they don't want anybody going in or out of town. The father calls and explains that he can't get to the airport, but also can't get back into town. The entire county is under quarantine, enforced by the military. We also hear him say he's on Route 26, meaning that had he recognized the signs of what's going on earlier outside the school and acted more decisively, they could have all left together like a lot of their neighbors did. They could have then gone far east and either left the state of California altogether, or if this thing goes full on zombie apocalypse mode, they're less than a hundred miles away from Stanislaus National Forest. For the same reasons the Horicon National Wildlife Refuge in Dawn of the Dead was a good idea, this would work out fantastically here too. There's gonna be plenty of things to hunt, relatively low populations, and still a more than decent access to civilization from there to scavenge once things die down. Instead, the girls are now on their own, and despite their father's stark warning about the severity of the situation, they're only seeing this as a ticket to their own freedom. That is exactly why I said to have a group discussion about this virus and what it does. I'm sure if Daddy Michael would have sat down his girls and said, hey, I have a PhD in this thing, and basically, this is a virus that makes people super sick, pretty much seize up horrifically, and then come back as a mind-controlled sort of parasite zombie that vomits blood on others to spread it further, they would listen to him. I can't order pizza, the website's on crack. Instead, they're completely unprepared, have no supplies or weapons whatsoever, and are trying to order a f pizza instead. Brownies. This is not an airborne disease. This is one that can be controlled. Obama tells the nation that the spread of the disease can absolutely be limited and controlled. But we now already know from actual real life experience how seriously people tend to take this. Maybe it would have been different if her own worm flu would have had people vomiting blood on each other. What are you doing? I was watching that. It was boring and depressing. Holy sh the negative IQ thinking just runs in this family. You guys realize you are in a quarantine, right? This thing your president was talking about that's got military vehicles on your roads, helicopters flying overhead with medical equipment, your father not allowed to back into town, and your mother held at an airport overnight. Take a hint. Emma hears something in the house and goes to check it out because, of course, Hello? she calls out and literally hears someone messing with a mail slot on her front door. Once she made her presence known, it immediately stopped. What does Emma do? <laughs> she looks through the goddamn opening in her door where she wouldn't be able to see sh and be super vulnerable instead of, I don't know, any of these windows next to her. Daisy, because someone's standing at the front door. She calls for Stacy's help to check it out, but says someone's at the front door. Uh, what the fuck do you mean, someone's at the front door, Emma? What you meant to say, I think, was, Stacy, someone just tried to stick their fuck hand through the slot for mail in our front door to forcefully make entry into our house during this lockdown. Let's grab some weapons and barricade the sh out of our entryways. Of course, with your sh half-baked explanation, she won't take this seriously. Because of this, she's also likely going to be stupid enough to open the door separating you from a potential attacker or a parasitic zombie. Nobody there. But of course, when she opens this, because of horror movie cliches, nobody's there. <laughs> Just as they call all clear, CJ pounces on Emma and only gets thrown on his ass. For it. How did you even sneak in here? Because I'm a ninja with the hide key. Of course. So not only is CJ here not currently full of either 5.56, 9mm, or stab wounds, we left him a key to the house. Can you imagine if that was a parasite zombie? Hey. Uh oh. Mm -mm. Disregarding the lame square sh 
like curfews, what their dad explicitly forbade them to do, and the general mountain of info basically casually informing them of the mother of all shit storms waiting to erupt literally on their doorstep, Stacy proceeds to share bodily fluids with CJ like she's aching to be his parasitic zombie waifu for the rest of this god-awful movie. Since when does the flu make you want to attack people? Emma checks out Gracie's social media to see if she's active on there, but finds nothing more than a basic message from her parents saying she's stable, which I sincerely doubt based on what we saw earlier. In the comments, a guy explains that this flu makes people attack each other and that none of this makes sense as they're trying to quarantine half the state of California. I feel like no clue is strong enough to make Emma realize what's happening around her though. Stacy's even more hopeless. Literally just trying to ride this apocalypse out in the other room. The next morning, Emma awakens to military vehicles cruising through their neighborhood, along with the CDC. They've been left with a box of 12 MREs and a disaster preparedness kit. Inside the kit, we see what appears to be basic PPE, first aid supplies, a biohazard trash bag, a compass wind-up flashlight combo, an emergency flare, emergency drinking water, and a leaflet explaining the symptoms of the infection and who to contact if they see anyone exhibiting them. I can already tell you, they didn't read any of that. Why are you doing a robot? The only things that appear to be missing to me are a Fitbit and an autoject, which is sad because I would have liked to see them use them. Emma's literally the only one who even cares a little bit, which is crazy. Do you guys honestly believe that the military would be coming in to hand out supplies and restricting people's access to their homes if it wasn't a big deal? She's still at the airport. Patients are going missing. This is crazy. Despite their mom calling to say she's still not allowed to leave the airport and the news broadcast clearly showing both Gracie and the guy who helped her with Gracie's seizure earlier, now both deemed infected and missing, they keep goofing off like this is all fine. There's a party in phase two tonight. It's not cool. Stacy, it's not cool is doing your homework in dirty sweats when there's no school tomorrow. Uh, no. What's not cool is dragging your little sister to a social gathering during a zombie virus outbreak and risking everyone's life because you're so smitten by Sir Never Thinks A Lot. I get that homework is also, aside from occupying your mind, probably the least important thing right now, but I'd still say it's significantly better than parting it up right now. Seriously, Stacy, how the hell are you this stupid? And because she pretended to be Emma and texted Evan, letting him know she'll be at the party too, she now feels like she has no other option. Gotta love some good old peer pressure. She even walks to this party on the streets, unarmed, alone. At the party, she's the only person who's taken this seriously enough to wear any PPE. In fact, the others even use their PPE as party attire. Until Emma sees Evan, and her teenage hormones compel her to choose reproduction over self-preservation. They dance. Strangers exchange bodily fluids. Or tequila! They engage in underage drinking, the usual. Eventually, Emma and Evan find their own place to talk in a yet-to-be-installed hot tub. We're having a moment. Yeah, some weird-ass moment. You know, this is not what people mean when they say doing it in a hot tub, right? What the hell is that? Stacy runs off super angry because CJ's a cheating dirtbag, while Evan loses track of them. Meanwhile, the inevitable finally happens the guy who helped Emma with Gracie earlier in the movie. He's not looking so hot. She was actually ah! Finally, these two dumb a wake up from their teenaged angst fever dream and notice that they're in serious danger. Please, what's wrong with they take shelter in a nearby, relatively well-secluded room and look through what is either a keyhole or a glory hole to see the chaos unfolding just in the next room. Time to grab literally anything nearby as a weapon and GTFO home, immediately. There's plenty of people to throw at this guy for baits if you really need to, but why would you corner yourself in the same area as the threat? It's clearly an active renovation project in this house, meaning at the very minimum, some tools may be around if nobody swiped them yet. A screwdriver or hammer will do if need be. A 2x4 is also pretty useful and potentially even better for range. Guys, it was also like 20 to 1 at least. F 
this guy's day up right here right now while you still got numbers the transformation process isn't instant from what we can tell so there's literally just one threat Instead, they just wait far too long and listen to this random party goer get brutally murdered instead of taking this guy three to one, at the very least. Now they're next, and they'll be forced to do it two to one, since everyone apparently bolted out of the house except you two morons. They slowly walk hand in hand, making plenty of noise themselves. Girls, your shoes alone are making a f ton of noise on that floor. You're still unarmed, and the guy can clearly hear you hyperventilating since it's quiet as hell all of a sudden. Grab a weapon. Don't walk. Run. Is he gone? Holy sh- They're even talking out loud. <laughs> she just stands still like a fuck NPC. Takes the money shot to the face, doing nothing. Doesn't try to dodge it, cover her face, literally anything. <laughs> Emma fights off the zombozo, but he's got the stamina that only a parasitic zombie worm can give someone, while Stacy is still in shock and frozen. Fortunately, Evan comes in with a 2x4 to the spine, which he then immediately drops. <laughs> Whatever, I agree, let's get out of here. Something tells me these cops aren't gonna be eager to let us go after learning about this encounter. Now, Stacy got all that sh all over her face. There's no way she's not infected, no matter how hard she tries telling Emma that it didn't get in her nose or eyes or mouth or whatever. There's just no way. I understand not giving her up to the authorities, especially not without consulting your father, who specializes in this stuff to see if there's any way to circumvent her turning into a zombie, or if the best thing to do is just take her out back like a lame horse. This wait and see method is just stupid though. Now there are reports on these gatherings of infected. Emma continues watching some more videos about the conspiracy. Possible alien sightings. Learning that these attacks pretty much happened all over the world at the same time. And that there's areas functioning as nests with higher concentrations of infected. The next morning, they wake up together. Wait, you slept in the same bed together? <laughs> what the hell? How can you be this stupid? If anything, you should have been sleeping in separate rooms with barricades in both rooms just in case someone gets in. Or if Stacy would randomly turn. She literally could have turned overnight and then Emma would be fucked too. This is just mind blowing levels of stupid. <laughs> CDC guys knock on their door and check them both out for signs of infection. They lie, saying they haven't been in contact with anyone infected, but actually pass their checks without any problems. I find it incredibly hard to believe that Stacy isn't actually infected here. Sorry. They keep trying to reach their parents and finally get a call back. Hey, Dad. You remember where my gun is? Finally. I mean, still, this implies the guy had a license and could have easily gone all out to the local gun store and gone with his entire family to Stanislaus National Forest, like I suggested earlier. But okay, better a gun than no gun, and better late than never. Even though Stacy's almost certainly fu- Launched an air raid on the news, playing in the background instead of taking up their full attention. Even once in this goddamn movie, we see that China's already decided to bomb towns when failing to contain the virus. Meaning we may have a huge, huge problem on our hands if we don't consider a plan B to get out of town somehow. Communications finally cut out as they try to figure out what's going on. Come on, you know what's going on. This is about as clear as it gets. You have interacted with a zombie. Know that you're under quarantine. No, nobody can go in or out of town. Comms are being cut, and your dad told you to grab his gun. It's about as in your face right here as it's ever gonna get. Barricade your house. The President of the United States has declared martial law. Martial law is finally declared announced in an emergency broadcast. Okay, so now you can be certain it's about to get significantly out of hand. Will you please tell me what's going on? Guys, can you focus on the issue at hand here? What is this pathetic attempt at defense? Stacy's looking for a gun here, as she should be. Emma, you should be downstairs actively barricading every entrance and ground level window with whatever heavy furniture you can. Make sure everything is locked and covered up. Fill up any empty container with water, bathtubs, buckets, glasses, cups, sinks, as this is about to become a concern for you. And you live in California. Your parents' marital failures can wait until you have your basics taken care of. 
The gun Stacy takes out of their parents' bedroom appears to be a Beretta M92FS, along with one magazine. That's quite little, and wouldn't have been the case if we actually stocked up beforehand. Okay, so that means about 15 rounds. We also learn that Stacy used to go to the range with her dad, meaning she does have some firearms experience and likely some level of training. Though they're both idiots. In my opinion, she should take the extra 10 to 15 minutes after things are barricaded, or even just the 30 second version right here and now, of explaining how this gun's basic mechanisms work. Safety, how to align sights and shoot it, etc. Since she knows she's probably infected, making sure her sister knows how to use their limited 15 bullets is probably a good idea. At night, we see their new neighbors shooting up flares, as Emma's hopelessly trying to text her dad instead of, I don't know, barricading the house. You can't seriously be this naive. Hey, over here. Mr. Toomey's trying to bring the military towards him for help and medical aid. They order him to stay back, as would be normal in a situation like this. When they go to carry out his wife, he starts freaking out, saying they're not infected. Dude, I understand that, but you could probably see why they wouldn't believe you, right? Just stay calm and let them do their job. Comply. They may never have had any real intention to help them though, but if you're already going to call out for them, comply. If not, why call them? A lot more flares go up into the sky, almost signaling to them that the outbreak is getting closer and closer. For the millionth time, please barricade your home. We have to get out of here. Think you're a little late for that now. Stacy pulls their car out of the garage while Emma keeps watch. Heaven! Are you serious? You're keeping watch because you don't want to be spotted. You know there's a curfew. You know the military has checkpoints in place. You know what they're likely going to do to you guys. Why are you making it obvious to the entire neighborhood you're doing this? If you really had to get your boy toy along for the ride, at least alert him before you even pull the car out so you can wait a bit and make it less obvious or plan it for later that night. But throwing rocks at his window with your car, with its lights on, I might add, idling while you yell for Evan is so profound Profoundly stupid. I was kind of hoping for you to get caught doing this. Evan's allowed to come out and play, and the girls actually make it out onto the road. The main road. We gotta turn around. You guys were told days ago that there's a quarantine going on. Nobody in or out. Your own father, a resident of the town, could not enter the quarantine zone. You knew this. You could have been 100% certain there would be blockades. If you were going to do this, the plan should have been to ditch the car when you got anywhere near the edge of town and sneak far, far away from the main roads. However, to even attempt this, you'd need to be very lucky, considering the military will have teams posted along a perimeter area. There will be gaps, but finding those without getting detected would be tough. You guys also didn't pack any supplies, which to attempt this, seeing as you'd be going on foot once near the edge of town, you would absolutely need, as you'd be without transportation battling the elements right after. There's just so much dumb crammed into one scene. And just wait for it. <laughs> it gets dumber. Get back back your vehicle Easy. now. She goes to speech check the military military unit to let one slip by their quarantine checkpoint, and it goes about how you'd expect. Another car tries to get through the blockade and gets absolutely deleted by repeated mag dumps of 556 as the girls finally decide to turn back. Dumb ass. Even when you're thinking in the right direction, you two find a way to mess it up. Truly impressive. There you go. Called it. Stacy's infected. What's worse, she's being a huge piece of sh because she's not even telling her sister, endangering her. I like Emma for now. I don't want to make Emma sad by rooting for Stacy's death, but she's really pushing it at this point. Stay in your home. It is now a felony to harbor an infected individual. A military Humvee drives past the neighborhood announcing new restrictions. See, even they are now telling you to shelter in place and stay home, to barricade your house. 
Stacy tries to perform surgery on herself, which makes all of zero sense. Again, tell your sister. If you did, she'd tell you that they were looking at a video of how to do this in class just days ago, and she would 100% do this better than you with two mirrors from a shit angle, while you can barely see anything, let alone manipulate a fine instrument with your hand backwards like that. When she actually tries to touch this thing with a needle, it sends her falling over, nearly into a seizure of her own. But of course, she also does not tell Emma about that. Best to just pretend nothing's wrong. Hey, after all, it's working out great for your parents, right? What, too soon? I cheated on mom. When she does finally decide to fess up about something, it's about the reason their parents are divorcing. Turns out, Michael got caught doing one of his grad students by Stacy. She told their mom, which caused a huge fight. They chose not to tell their youngest daughter because they thought she couldn't handle it. Dude, I swear, this mindset is gonna get people killed. Evan bangs on the door, and against Stacy's better judgment, Emma decides to open the door anyway. He rushes in with a bloody forehead and lets the girls know his abusive alcoholic stepdad is infected and on his way to mess their day up. Okay, one of you quickly grab some furniture instead of asking dumb questions. Barricade that door. Call 911 since this should still work for reporting infected and all that. Or fire off the flare to alert these people to your location and let them take care of this thing for you. Instead, they 3v1 the door and then immediately let it go as soon as Evan's stepdad stops banging on the door. Barricade the door for the trillionth time. <laughs> can't see anything anymore. Okay, good. So let's make a sound trap. Throw a rock onto the street from a bedroom window. Anything. However, you know what also helps? Don't move. Not standing with three people staring at this door like morons. And at least locking that deadbolt too. Putting some heavy furniture against it. And then getting help or distracting him. Also, how about Stacy, who currently is still conscious of her decisions, handles the gun, since she's actually trained? Why was Emma going towards the door with it at all from the dinner table earlier? Why is Evan now holding the gun at all? Stacy's the one who knows what to do with it. Evan actually walks towards the door. You moron, back away so we can't clear the gap between you before you can actually pull the trigger. Go upstairs, now. Barricade the staircase and post up there with a the gun. Pop him if he comes up. There's no time to barricade the windows anymore. Instead, they stand around like dumb a and this happens. They try to go for the stealth playthrough, rather than realizing it's still 3v1, having one person throw something into the kitchen and having another pick up the gun and dome this sucker. It's okay, I get it. That steam achievement will turn itself. Unfortunately, people need to breathe and this makes noise. Just as Emma's getting her close up with a parasitic creep, Stacy caps the guy with a point blank headshot, even ensuring to approach him from the flank as to not put Emma in the firing line with excellent trigger discipline, I may add. Nice. Ah oh, man, now I don't want her to die anymore. <laughs> Stacy oh seizes up and negligently discharges the Beretta. <laughs> While Stacy's giving us one of the best Gollum impressions I've seen in a movie in a long time, these idiots again do not put a victim of a seizure on their side, causing her to nearly suffocate on her own blood. Stacy's going batch after she wakes up again, clearly going overly hungry now as the parasite takes hold of her. She begs and pleads with Emma. Emma and Evan even argue and debate whether or not they should feed Stacy. I don't really think it makes a difference. Obviously, the parasite has to eat, but if there's no way to prevent it from mind controlling Stacy, then you're just delaying the same outcome and depleting your own supplies in the process. In any case, the one intelligent decision they do make here is to stick together because that's one horror movie cliche they do know never split up there's also this gem which i have to admit is pretty clever they make it seem as though there's nobody left inside so the military doesn't figure out what's really going on which makes sense since they just kill stacy outright at this point I don't believe he's ever hungry. the whole time stacy keeps begging emma for food you know what's funny they actually barricaded only that room seriously not the front door or the windows or literally any area but the one place with your infected sister in holy sh
I'm literally losing brain cells on this one. Emma, please leave. Emma won't leave Stacy, despite her telling Emma she needs to leave. I can't disagree here. The likelihood there's a cure for this is next to zero. She's a goner one way or another. You can still make it out of town on foot if you just stop sticking to only main roads and actually put your head to use. Of course, none of that matters because the power of friendship and love. I know it's hard, Emma, but you need to understand, you're just making Stacy suffer. Every second you don't dome cap her with a nine mil, you're doing her wrong. We get a montage of Emma studying up on parasites, presumably looking to see if she can single-handedly do in one afternoon what the entire US military and the CDC have been unable to do through rigorous research along with many other governments for months. Sure, on the roof of the house, they can't get anything on the radio because no sh- I'm never gonna see my dad again. Hey, hey, probably. Hello? CJ just walks into their house because they didn't lock the back door. Are you serious? You barricaded your sister in because you know how dangerous the infected are. An infected person literally threw themselves through your window just yesterday and you don't lock the door. Stacy! CJ calls out for Stacy, having zero tactical awareness. He eventually stumbles upon the barricade that's holding her captive and falls for her parasitic mind games before getting properly thanked for cheating on her. <laughs> Evan and Emma arrive at the scene when Stacy's already had her fill for now. She says it made her do it, that she can't stop it. Right, which is exactly why you take that trusty 92FS, put her round in the chamber, and send her to CJ. Instead, they prepare for some experimental surgery, with Emma claiming she's going to save her. She gives her sister the laced MRE and waits for her to knock out but not before she stupidly exposes her limbs to her infected sister, because it's not like you're literally inches away from the bloodstains of the last person who tried to do that and paid for it with her life. Even as Stacy herself says, it's going to make me hurt you. It's only through movie plot armor bullshit that nothing happens here. Stacy tells Emma once again to GTFO and go find their dad, which I still agree with. Sentimental music plays, and she takes her mask off. Dude, you know these things are left for dead spitters. Are you kidding me? Your entire state is under martial law because of this virus making people devour their wives, husbands, and even children. And you take your mask off to make a sentimental point. I'm starting to seriously consider that out of these two, while I did initially have more beef with Stacy, I'm starting to wish I could have had them swap places now. Let Emma die if she wants to be this dumb, and give me the badass rebellious chick that could drop bodies with a Beretta and rip a grown man's arm off. As soon as Stacy knocks out from all the sleeping meds they put in her food, they begin tearing off the barricade and prepping her for surgery. I like how now she cares for the mask when Stacy's asleep, but not when she's staring you straight in the eyes, awake, telling you it will make her attack and spit blood in your face. She basically remembers her dad's teachings in class and tries to suffocate the parasite so it'll surface for oxygen, giving her an opportunity to pull it out. This is a technique that works for several types of larvae that bury into their hosts. But here's my basic question for you, Emma. What makes you think the CDC didn't already think of this? If it was really this simple, why wouldn't it already have been done? By some miracle, it actually does cause this thing to surface, which yanks Stacy out of her sleep and gets her to finish the job herself. <laughs> Straight up nightmare fuel, but also kind of metal. Stacy, you're really starting to grow on me. Evan stomps out the parasite as Stacy regains consciousness. She appears okay, but I mean, can you really be sure? By order of the governor of California. The next morning, the military's patrolling the streets again, and they left Stacy to sleep out in a normal, unbarricaded room. Okay, dude, just what? You may have removed that thing, but it was enormous. It wasn't normal, and nothing about this should be making you feel that calm. She should have been under lock and key for another three days, minimum. Besides, she shouldn't and wouldn't care about a little bit more confinement if this thing is now out of her system and she becomes normal again. Whatever, better just risk it all. Hey, bitch. 
I guess she's supposed to be better already. Looks so much better. I mean, her wound was still covered with the tape as a precaution and nothing happened, so maybe? But no, no way. Come on, you cannot tell me, plot gods or not, that the CDC wouldn't have tried this already. Not buying it. Another Becky in a Becky universe where teenagers with zero experience outperform career experts in their chosen field of study. All through the power of friendship, love, and one high school class's period worth of knowledge. Somehow the military has some kind of thermal imaging which can actually see through walls and roofs. This shows us pockets of infected congregating in houses, kind of like Dark Seekers in I Am Legend. It also stands to reason then that they know we're here and will come looking any second. But really, this is just movie BS and thermals can't actually see through walls. Emma has a nightmare of Stacy still being infected, but then wakes up to all the food in their house being gone and Stacy bolting it down the street. Emma, gone. She stupidly follows her, not even knowing where she's running to. If she's infected, wherever she's going, you don't want to go, Emma. They make their way through the remnants of the neighborhood and follow Stacy into a very specific house. Despite Evan begging her not to go in, Emma can't leave her. They grab the wind-up flashlight from the preparedness kit in this particular house and go to investigate. Okay, whatever reason Stacy has for being here, you clearly are in the wrong place. Time to leave. Hey, this isn't where I parked my car. This is such a bad idea, it's absolutely astonishing you're actually going through with this. Sure enough, they stumble on a group of infected, standing just mere feet away from them, all being mind controlled together into some kind of hive mind feeding circle, which I guess Stacy's come to join. Obviously, the flashlights in their faces mere inches away from them quickly awakens the horde, causing them to run for their lives while the hive mind sends sound signals to each other to communicate. They get cut off from the back door and decide to corner themselves even harder upstairs. It seemed like one zombie there, and as I seem to recall, you have a gun. For the first time in this entire movie, they actually barricaded themselves away from the danger as they come face to face with Stacy again. She tells Emma that she has no control over this. She can still hear the parasite controlling her and begs Emma to kill her. Emma, please! Emma. <laughs> She was about to hesitate again when Stacy finally transforms and leaves her no choice but to put her down for good. After which, she drops the gun and falls to her knees while Evan holds the horde off alone. What is it with this movie and people dropping their weapons? Emma. Evan carries Emma out of it and they make their escape out the window and up to the roof. We gotta go as they see B2 starting their bombing run, similarly to the news report earlier in the movie of the Chinese military bombing one of their cities, while Evan is still screaming at Emma to get her head in the game. Emma! I'm feeling his frustration. This is getting irritating. Maybe the B2 will free me from this suffering. Got jump. Uh, what? I can pretty much guarantee you there is no way on God's green earth that if you were standing straight in a B2's bombing run flight path, a tiny little backyard swimming pool would save you. All that water would either instantly evaporate purely due to energy and heat, cooking and burning you alive instantly, or you would just vanish into a crater along with the rest of this entire house, leaving nothing left of you to begin with. Whatever, the plot gods blessed you two with being the only living thing left in this gorgeous fireball. After we cut away from the city, Emma and Evan make their way to the gas station along Route 26 her dad mentioned to her on the phone earlier. There, she finds a picture of her family left to her by her parents. The back of the picture says they're at her Uncle Peter's in Washington State to come find them there. But like, why? That's like 800 miles away. I still think the National Forest, just 50 miles east of them, is realistically where the military would push back and set up a refugee collection area at. In any case, they found a working vehicle, which should make this whole ordeal much more doable. And they finally get that kiss their teenage hormones have been screaming for since like five minutes into this thing. The movie ends. Of our original protagonists, only Emma and Evan survived. 
Gracie was one of the first to get infected, so there wasn't much to be done about her condition. CJ could have been saved had he just questioned why a barricade would have been put up on a door that Stacy was kept locked up in. Stacy could have lived had she just taken the situation a bit more seriously, or had any common sense. Come to think of it, a lot of things in this movie were preventable outright with some common sense. For that reason, I think Viral was beaten. Moral of the story, never trust your government when they tell you everything is fine. And thanks again to Scentbird for sponsoring today's video. Check the links in the description and use my promo code NERD55OFF for 55% off your first month at Scentbird.com.